The presentation is with regards to the, it's called road to registration for candidacy and professional registration, but it's more aligned, the candidacy registration I'll talk about, it's more, it's, a, it's only one slide, then it's, I'll talk about it, it's only when you qualify from an accredited program or you go to substantial equivalence, then you can register. But the focus would be more on the professional registration of which I think most of the attendees are looking forward to that. So let's move on. This is the content, the table of contents with regards to where will I start. We'll first start with the regulatory context in which the professional registration operates in the country and the built environment landscape and the regulation of the engineering profession, the relationship with the voluntary associations and the role players related to registration, the professional development model, the registration requirements will continue. And then here we are in terms of the regulatory context. Let's start at the beginning as to why this and where do we have this registration? In terms of the regulatory context, um, the Engineering Council of South Africa is a regulatory engineering profession. And then section 22 of the Constitution of the Republic, which is the supreme law of the country, refers that every citizen has the right to choose their trade, occupation, or profession very freely. That practice might, uh, of a trade or occupation or profession may be regulated by law. Now, we've got three words that are coming in there to say the trade, occupation, or profession. We've got the, another council, which is QCTO, standing for Quality Council for Trade and Occupation. So it covers the first two words, trade and occupation. On the professional side is the Engineering Council of South Africa, starting with qualifications of NQF level five, moving over. Basically, it's NQF level six upwards diplomas, but now with regards to the new uh, higher education qualification sub-framework, we're also now entering into the territory of the QCTO or the trade and occupations with regards to the higher certificate. Then South Africa chose to regulate the profession as is stated in the constitution to say may be regulated by, by law, uh, that what will be done in the profession or the trade or occupation. And this gave rise to the Engineering Professions Act uh, 2000, Act number 46 of 2000, um, abbreviated as the APA. And then the, the, the act provided for the establishment of a juristic person to be known as the Engineering Council of South Africa. So council is seen as a juristic person, meaning the person representing the, the, the whole part of what you're talking about. And I'll just give a little bit information with regards to that. Council, the Engineering Council of South Africa is the regulatory body or the statutory body. It consists of 50 council members. Those 50 council members are appointed by the Ministry of Public Works and Infrastructure. Inside the 50, 30 of them are professionals. Inside the 30, 20 must be practicing, 10 might be retired. The remaining 20 shared among those that are from the public and the other 10 is from the state that are appointed directly by the minister from various departments of, um, of, of, of government, not necessarily only from the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure to those where they've got an impact with regards to the infrastructure. And then EXA then appoints the CEO, a uh, council appoints the CEO, CEO appoints staff. So this is when you talk of council, we refer to the 50 council members appointed by the Ministry of Public Works and Infrastructure. Then the registration is a tool by which EXA regulates the profession. We came down from what the constitution is saying and we broke it down. So EXA uses registration to now regulate the profession. With regards to the built environment landscape, which you just spoke about, uh, South Africa has got the another body which is overarching this six built environment council, starting from the, the Ministry of Public Works and Infrastructure. Then we've got Council for the Built Environment, which is overarching the six councils. The first one is the architects, as you can see there. And then the second one is the landscape architects. The third one is the Engineering Council of South Africa, circled there in red or in a red uh, triangle, a rectangle. Then you've got the property valuers, then you've got the project managers and construction managers and the quantity surveyors. So all of these six councils are forming what you call the built environment. They all fall under the built environment. But what is very strange, if you check all of them, their names start with SAC, all of them. It's only the Engineering Council of South Africa that is unique uh, with a different name compared to others that are, are there. 
I have just touched base in terms of the, the governance of the engineering council. I'll just uh, skip this one because I've already spoken about it. And then we move now to the value chain of XI. Remember we said at the beginning, I said at the beginning, XI now uses the registration as the tool to regulate the profession. What XI does, it does research, it writes policies, standards and producers, procedures and develop, procedural development. All of these are in, in, encapsulated in the Engineering Professions Act in terms of the delegation, delegation of power that is given by the Act to EXA to be able to can regulate the profession by doing that. Then after that is done, that leads to the second part in the value chain, which is accreditation of engineering programs that I referred to that candidates will register from those that are from the accredited programs. And then there's registration, which we are talking about today and quality assurance thereof afterwards. And then after that, when once, some, once a, a graduate is registered or a candidate is registered, then they have to observe professional conduct. And then it goes on like that. And then they have to observe, they have to conduct the CPD so that they can keep their registration um, alive after every five years. So this is the value chain of a registry. EXA does other things as well that are not related for here today, but this is where the core of the registration is all about and where it's come from. Now, as you can see, this uh, extract is coming directly from the Act, Section 18 of the Act, where it talks about the categories of registration. If we start below, moving up, Section 8B refers to the candidate, which is divided into candidate engineer, candidate engineering technologist, and candidate engineering technician. And C is about the specified categories. Uh, there are many of them that now and then come by, and EXA has to look after those that are not necessarily in the profession. And then once that is done in terms of registration, it goes back to Section 181A with regards to the professional registration of professional engineer, professional engineering technologist, professional engineering technician. In between there, there's also another peculiar animal that I want to talk about, which is the candidate certificated engineer. Those are those that uh, one way or the other, one of the entrance requirement is the government certificate of competency, and it's only in certain um, categories, it's in certain domains of engineering. For example, in electrical engineering, mining, and mechanical engineering, and not in civil engineering or analytical engineering, for example. So in a way, these are the core um, categories of registration that Excel looks into. And again, we'll be talking about the International Engineering Alliance, where the, rele the relevance is whereby it's only the professional engineer and the professional engineering technologist and professional engineering technician that are recognized at the International Engineering Alliance. And the story behind it, because the professional certificated engineer is a peculiar animal to South Africa only. This shows the categories of registration that we just spoke about, including now the specified categories, because now when you split them, there are many of them, as they are indicated there below, on the presentation. These are as when and when the needs arises that EXA has to cater for those that are not necessarily in the profession as a whole. Hence, they are referred to as the specified categories. As you can see, the lifting inspectors, lifting machinery inspectors, registered medical equipment maintainers, fire protection systems, civil laboratory technical controllers, and so on and so on. There are many that are coming on board now and then. And that research part of EXA in the value chain is what we look into. Here we are looking at the professional development model. They are, they start at stage one. The applicant I will go through will come from an accredited program. You remember part of the second part of the value chain refers to the accreditation, then registration. So first accredited pro the, the applicant or candidate will go through an accredited program. Then once they have that, then they meet, they meet st stage one, which is the standard for engineering education. Then after graduation, they register as candidates which at the moment is not compulsory, but it assists if you register as a candidate and there are consequences, there are financial consequences. If you register as a candidate, you pay your annual fees, which are less, pay the three years minimum, that will be a candidate. And then when you register, you'll pay almost amount 4,000 something or 5,000. But if you are not, then you're going to pay 9,000. So you get penalized for not having had registered as a candidate, though it is not compulsory at the moment. With the identification of engineering work, that is stipulated in section 26 of the act. We don't know how that is going to change in the future. Then in the candidacy registration, it is expected that the candidate meets the requirement of the 11 outcomes of professional registration. We'll just talk about them when you get to that presentation slide. 
And then once it satisfies the, the, the parts of for registration from training and experience, then we say stage two, it means the candidate or the applicant has met the standard for professional competency. Then they are able to, legible to register. You can see on, the, on my left-hand side on the presentation, professional registration, then they reach that professional registration. The minimum is three years to be in here, but at times it takes more than three years, depending on the work training plan of the employer and the needs and the, the necessary requirements that the employer has in meeting those 11 um, outcomes for professional registration. Then once the applicant is registered, they've, they are allowed to go and practice. As you can see here, they've got that license to practice. Now, in that stage three, they have to observe code of conduct and they have to maintain competence through CPD and pay the annual fees on top of that. And as, we, as I've said earlier, the, the registration is a five-year renewal process in which from that uh, maintaining competence through CPD, the applicant must meet five, at least five credits per year. In a five-year cycle, would be five multiplied five years, then it means it's 25 credits. A credit comes from a, an eight-hour course that is attended by the applicant. You can make the meds coming from there. Depending on the time is what uh, denotes that. And this is coming from the South African system of education, which is the... South African Qualification Authority or SAQA, whereby it talks of the notional hours, and that's how they are calculated. So that's the, the nice and short of it in terms of the professional development model. Moving further now, we talk of these common requirements that now are required for registration. First, we'll start with the in the candidates in the candidates candidate category. The applicant must meet the educational requirements for that category, and we'll just talk about them now. The educational requirements may be met by holding an extra accredited qualification or an acceptable combination of accredited qualification prescribed for that category. So those, the first one is where EXA knows and, uh, about those qualifications and they've accredited them. The second one is holding a qualification or a combination of qualifications recognized under an international agreement, that is the educational course under the auspices of the International Engineering Alliance, relevant to that category. EXA is a, state, is a signatory to the International Engineering Alliance, which um, those countries came together to form uh, what they call an alliance for ease of mobility. So they recognize each other's qualifications in terms of mobility. So if it comes from those accords, uh, the way access is signatory to, it makes it easier as well, over and above the, those that have been accredited by EXA. So that's the second part. The third part with regards to that is with regards to the holding a qualification or a combination of qualifications that have been determined case by case evaluation to satisfy criteria for substantial equivalence to an accredited qualification for that category. On this one, remember when now the word accreditation is not mentioned. The previous one is the one that has been accredited by EXA, second one coming accredited by those that are in the same accords under the International Engineer Alliance. And here are those qualifications that, that are not accredited by EXA, not known by EXA, not endorsed by EXA, but they will be taken case by case evaluation to satisfy substantial equivalence to an accredited qualification. So what EXA does, they take the combination thereof for a qualification to check if it meets the necessary requirements of the accredited qualifications as stated by EXA. Last but not least, the fourth one is to present a combination of evidence determined by EXA for that category that includes an individual level of educational achievement against criteria demonstrate that it is substantially equivalent to an accredited qualification. What this simply means is sometimes education is not only formal from attending classes and getting a degree or a diploma. There's also recognition of prior learning as it is enshrined in the Constitution of the Republic. So those are also recognized. So the educational, the education business unit at EXAM will do what you call an educational background evaluation to look for the substantial equivalence that over and above, not the formal education, what is it that this applicant or a graduate uh, or a candidate have that can be uh, substantially equated to an accredited qualification? And as you can see there below on the slide, those are the documents that refers to uh, where the information is coming from or where it can be found. R-01POL is the overarching policy of registration. PC stands for uh, R-01POL. The POL stands for policy. PC stands for professional categories. It means then for the specified categories will be R-01 POL SC for specified categories. And then R-03-PRO, this, uh, this PRO, PRO stands for process. The R-03 talks about the process that needs to be followed when applying at EXA. R-04P is about the guide to the mentors 
and the candidates that are in training. E-17 PRO is an education qualification, is, is, is an education evaluation a document. PRO stands for process in terms of how that process will be done that we just spoke about for number three and four here. The R series document at access uh, for registration. The E series documents are for education. There's a new one now, which is the A series, which is for the academies. We'll say we'll talk about it uh, next time. Uh, the academies in terms of what I, what they are. Now we just finished the one talking about the professional categories. I mean the candidate category. We now talk about the professional categories. Again, the requirement is that the, an applicant must demonstrate that they meet the educational requirements for that category. They demonstrate competence through against the uh, prescribed standards for registration in that category. So there are two things here. The first one is only meeting the educational requirements and registered as a candidate in that category. But now here it goes further. It says competence, performance, not necessarily experience. And we'll touch base on this as we go along. And reading from section 7.2.3 of the 04P, that is the guidance for mentors and candidates under training, it says it is deemed unlikely that competency can be developed in less than three years and demonstrated at the required level. Hence, as per provisions of the Engineering Profession Act, EXA has prescribed the period before applying for registration as minimum of three years. It at times takes longer. Now, it is very important in terms of this because there are normally cases that come at X and say, I'm working for a very small company. I do everything. I'm the jack of all trades in that company. Can I be registered in one and a half years or in two years? This is a time bar issue. I normally use an analogy of saying, if you, if your child um, is, um, is very brilliant, and I'm talking about the one that is underage before going to school, the going age to school in South Africa is seven years, and say, my child at four years, He's so brilliant. I want to enroll this child in the school. They say, no, the, only, the, the, the time bar issue here is seven years. So irrespective of how brilliant the child is, it's the same here. So irrespective of how we've accumulated that um, experience, I mean, that competence from the experience, before three years, you'll only be considered after three years. So it's a very critical part that many other uh, applicants or graduates or candidates miss. It is a time bar issue. You can only register after three years depending if you have met the requirements sometimes it takes longer but not more than the three years these are the uh, professional categories uh, registry of registration with regards to the education and the training and experience if we start first at the top looking at the professional engineer a qualification of four years will deem requirement is three years in terms of training and experience a qualification of five years is the same as you can see for professional technology uh, technologies uh, for professional engineering technologists with a qualification of three years the requirement is minimum four years uh, of training and experience and with a qualification of four years is vice versa is three years requirement of minimum training and experience same as for the professional engineering technician with a qualification education of two years the requirement is four years minimum of training and experience and with a qualification or education of three years it's going to be three years as well. So these are the benchmark qualifications that I'm we're referring to here in those that are created by EXA. Over and above what maybe might not be falling here, it has to go through that substantial equivalent um, under the auspices of May, those that are coming from unaccredited qualifications or that, that are coming from qualifications that are non, not known by EXA, that number three and number four, and those that have, will have gone through the recognition of prior learning as well. So this is very, very critical in terms of knowing the number of years required. This slide shows the alternative route that is given in terms of uh, coming from before 1971 up to post 1980 where we are. You'll see there in the red for registration as a professional or candidate engineering technician, that is what is required. The number of years experience and the responsible experience are very important. So what that means if I take the benchmark qualification here post 1980, look at the National Diploma Benchmark, this one comes from the NATED 151, and this one, Diploma in Engineering, is from the Higher Education Qualification Subframework, is the same. So it says minimum three years required post-qualification. Inside that three years, the candidate must have been in a responsible experience, meeting uh, the level of responsibility at level five. This is very, very important. So the, the responsible experience is inside the years of experience that are indicated here on the slide. Um, moving further in terms of, uh, again, on the benchmark route for the engineering technologies, now you'll see the benchmark there, which was used to be the BTEC. Then you'll also have now 
I think this is not showing so well, but it should be here on the on the slide uh, below, mm -hmm. which is the Bachelor of Engineering Technology, the one that is under the HQSF, and you can see the years of experience. So even with a diploma, somebody can register as a professional engineering technologist, which was in the uh, in te technician registration is minimum three years and one year responsible engineering experience. Then in here, it is eight years and minimum five. Years. Can you see the variance now that comes using the qualification for the next level? Because the, the diploma is a feeder to the next one. And um, this slide uh, shows the requirements with regards to the documents that EXA uses in terms of uh, registration. As we spoke, everything stems from the Engineering Profession Act. Let's, let us read what it says here. Council must accredit pro programs. They've got no choice. May recognize programs that are not accredited. Now, it's giving the leeway of may. May assess applicants. But when it comes on this side, it says council must register a person who demonstrate competency against standards. Remember when you started, we referred to Section 18 of the Act. This is coming from Section 19 of the Act. So this is the premise of with regards to registration or professional registration or candidate registration coming from the Engineering Profession Act. Then the overarching policy of registration are the zero one. If we go on the left hand side, whereby it prescribes the qualification standard, remember we said the E, the e that is shown in front of the, the, the postnomial there refers to education. E-02 PEPT PN. P stands for professional engineer, professional engineer technologist. Professor Engineering Technician, the qualification standard there. So there are a, vari a, a various of them that are there that can be referred to. And then those alternative will now lead to substantial equivalence whereby either 17 PRO is going to be used. That is on the side of education whereby an applicant come from a non-accredited qualification. Moving to the right hand side, EXA uses the competency standard R-02 PE, P10, P, uh, P, PT and PN. You can see here, the PCE, Professional en Certificated Engineer, and the space flight categories are not part of this. And this is what the assessors, evaluators, and moderators EXA use to evaluate the quality applicants. That's where the 10, 11 outcomes are stated. But over and above that, EXA made what you call a guide to competency standard. So R-08 explains R-02 in terms of going broader as a guide towards the competency standard. Reading them in that context, again, if you go down here, you'll see update 04, which is a training and mentoring guide that I spoke about earlier. But this also refers to the competency standard. But inside the training, that one will be undergoing under R04. There's also R05, which is a discipline specific. For example, I'm from the civil engineering background. We've got transportation engineering as, as a broad spectrum. Inside transport, we've got traffic engineering, transportation planning, materials engineering, and so on, or pavement uh, engineering, and so on. That's where the R-05 assist as well, uh, over adding over R-04. The R-03, as we spoke about, when you apply, is the is a process of application and assessment that describes that as well. So these documents are very, very critical to be known as well in terms of understanding what they refer to and what do they mean. Moving further, in terms of um, the requirements from X, I will look at the, the level descriptors now. We spoke about the category of registration and qualification. Now, here it is looking at the benchmark qualifications. If you check here, let's start at the top one, the engineer requirement for the benchmark qualification, Bachelor of Science in Engineering or the, or the Bachelor of Engineering or the, the, the Baccalaureate Engineers VSM in Afrikaans, and then the Master of Engineer. I just talk a little bit about the Master of Engineer. It's a very new one, which is under the E-22PE qualification standard at EXA. And that leads to solving complex engineering problems and performing complex engineering activities. We'll just talk about this uh, in the coming slides. For the engineering technologies, benchmark qualifications, Bachelor of Engineering Technology and Advanced Diploma in Engineering. These are coming from the HQSF. The BTEC, the one that we all know, the Bachelor of Technology in Engineering from Nantet 151, that has been uh, removed from the list in terms of being offered. It is still recognized and it will always be recognized as a qualification benchmark for engineering technologies, and that is for solving broadly defined engineering problems. Same as for the engineering technician, the diploma in engineering, diploma in engineering technology, and advanced certificate, which is in uh, both of them in engineering and in engineering practice that are leading to us. These are coming from the HQSF. The one in the middle come, is the same as the BTEC come from the NATED 151 program that has been now uh, removed from the system in terms of being offered 
and then that leads to solving well-defined engineering problems. So we'll define this in the coming slides in terms of what are the characteristics that defines them. We spoke about the minimum uh, training requirements as three years, as they also say they can take more than three years to acquire those competencies. So this is not about the experience. Inside that training and experience, it's about the competencies, achieving those competencies that will lead to the 11 outcomes. Again, it says it is imperative that training programs are well developed, managed and implemented by employer against under commitment and undertaking. So it goes back to now because the employer knows better in terms of their staff, in terms of the work that they do. Now, they need to have a well-structured work training plan that is going to assist the applicant moving forward. Spending time on a particular element or training without a qualitative objective will not ensure achievement of the required level of competence for that level. And that leads to redundancy. And we see a lot, it a lot, that because there's no plan that is aligned to the 11 outcomes, after a certain time of experience, the competence is not achieved by the applicants and they get frustrated. So this is very, very critical talking to the employers as in terms of where we are now in terms of aligning that. The goal of the training program now referring to R-04 is to allow the candidate to develop their candidates to develop their competence to the point of being able to demonstrate the outcomes, those 11 outcomes at the required level on a sustained basis and take responsibility to, of the, for the work performed. The, we'll talk about it now. What is very important is when reading the qualification standards, I mean, the professional registration standards in terms of competency standards, they always refer to the next document. You read R-02 refers to R-08. R-08 refers to R-04. R-04 will refer to R-05, the discipline specific document. They need to be read in that, in that, in that uh, chronological order for the flow of information. The candidate's role there is to participate um, and in that the owners arrest on them to ensure that the training received will culminate in the competency defined in the standard. At the end of the day, it is the responsibility of the candidate to make sure that they get what is required in terms of the professional registration. Although the employer, the mentors, the supervisors will always be there to assist, but the owners rest on the candidate. The supervisor's role, uh, the supervisor is a person who directs and controls the engineering work of the candidate and who takes the responsibility for the work in terms of section 18 subsection 4 of the engineering profession act that is the person who's 24 hours with the applicant in the workplace a mentor can be somebody who's not there in the workplace with a candidate it's like i'm mentoring many of the um, candidates that i'm not working with and because we rely on the supervisor and the applicant and the working environment for the guidance the supervisor is expected together with the mentor and the candidate to plan the training task by task to develop the candidate's competence and review the achievement of the task. This is very, very important. It takes everyone to make sure that the candidate receives the required training so that they can meet the competency that is required for professional registration. So that part is very, very critical. Moving further in terms of the performance of functions and competence, as you can see, professional and practitioners are able to perform functions because of their knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And those competencies developed by that competence developed by education, training, and experience. This is very, very important in terms of the niche that the applicants will have developed, coming from the knowledge that they have, coming from education, the skills that they develop in the, in the workplace, and their attitude, again, that is playing a very important role in terms of their development. And that obviously culminates to making up that competence with what we just referred to here below in terms of education, training, and experience. The development of professional competence uh, during the postgraduate period, that is a post-qualification, we talk now of an ideal situation here. The applicant or the candidate is in employment and works with and under the supervision of the qualified engineering supervisors and professional mentors. A professional mentor guides the applicant or the candidate's professional development with the assistance of the engineering supervisor. So the two always work together in terms of making sure that the candidate receives what is in the work training plan. And the training process may involve structured activities, including induction and training courses on specific skills or technologies. Over and above that is not only that. The requirement is also that the applicants develop themselves by going further an extra mile to read further, to develop themselves and inquire and be inquisitive so that they can build up that knowledge base for competency. The definition of the competence of outcomes, the 11 outcomes are defined, and these are conveniently grouped into five sets. We'll just talk about them. The stem of each outcome is the same in the competency standard for professional engineer, professional engineering technologist, and professional engineering technician. And these competency standards 
are differentiated by the insertion of level descriptors defined in a competency standard as the location shown by the level. Let me rather go to that slide so that I can show you what I'm talking about in terms of the level descriptors. In here, if we start first, we remember we said they are grouped into five sets, but there are 11 outcomes. So when you read them, you look at the group A is the engineering problem solving. Under group A, there are three outcomes, outcome one, outcome two, and outcome three. You see they are differentiated by the category engineers, engineering technologists, engineering technician, and specified categories. But we're only going to focus on engineers, engineering technologists, and engineering technicians. So the first one says, define, investigate, and analyze, you see the complex for engineers, broadly defined for technologies, well-defined for the engineering technician, and specifically defined for the specified categories. We just put it here so that you can see the difference. They all refer the same. The stem is the same. It's only the level descriptor. So the level descriptor is in the context in which that training and experience was done in terms of achieving those competencies for professional registration. And then outcome two is about design or develop of solutions to complex engineering problem, broadly defined, well-defined, Outcome three is about comprehending and applying knowledge or principles, specialist knowledge, jurisdiction, and local knowledge. To touch base on the first outcome, which is define, investigate, and analyze, it is required that the applicant must or the candidate must demonstrate competence in being able to define an engineering problem, be able to show competence in demonstrating to, in, uh, the power to, to investigate and analyze that what they've investigated. So it starts from there. And it leads to what will lead to either to the design or develop. Design is about the principles that will be applied as per either the codes or the requirements that are there coming from empirical evidence and so on and so on. But the critical one, which is not so well understood, it is the developing of solutions. For example, those that work for the construction might construction business or construction enterprises or in construction might not design but they develop solutions to the designs that are submitted by the consultants, those that have designed them. So in these, even the client bodies, they read the designs that were done by the designers. So by virtue of by reading them and making comments on them, remember, they all, you all have studied the same qualifications. You all have studied uh, at the same NQF level. You all have the same uh, experience. You're building competence on this. The fact that you can are able to interpret what the designer has done culminates into the developing of solutions. I normally use also an analogy that is outside where we are in terms of that technician who's servicing your car. The designer with the PhD designed your car, they left it. We know the other cars that were burning, we won't go into it for today. But that designer who, ma who maintains your car at the service is in fact the one that we should be registering because they develop solutions that are practical, that are tangible. So look into this in that because Many are unable to register and say, I don't have a design experience. The outcome is clear. I said design or develop. They are not saying end develop. So either of the two. But if you read R-02 and R-08, they explain clearly what these designing, developing of the solutions are. Outcome three refers to the comprehension and application of knowledge coming from the specialist knowledge in terms of your jurisdiction and local knowledge. This is mostly coming from what you have studied and how you apply it. So in terms of registration, it is a requirement to prove ensure that you are applying the theories that you have studied in your in your in your journey when you were studying in your engineering education how do you apply them hence and say how did you comprehend them and how do you apply them you need to demonstrate that application of that knowledge in terms of the principles specialist knowledge in your jurisdiction and local knowledge in terms of thereof it does not only have to say you've done design outcome number three request indicate what theories did you use and why did you use them and how do you comprehend them to assist you. So that is in group A. Moving further to group B, it is now in terms of the managing of engineering activities. There are only two outcomes there. You see the number continues. B now is for group B, it's four, five, six, four, five. You can see coming from number four. Managing part or all of more of level descriptor engineering activities. So in this one, how do you manage yourself? How do you manage the work that you are doing in terms of the engineering activities that you are doing? That's what simply this is all about. And then outcome five under group B is about communication in terms of how do you communicate clearly with others in the course of your work? You need to demonstrate that communication. How do you communicate with others? How do you receive information? How do you disseminate information into either orally, verbally, and in presentation format as well? In any other means to indicate that you are able to interpret what has been given to you and the other parties are also in, uh, able to interpret what you've given. For example, 
applicants or candidates will use site in, site, writing site instructions. When you write a site instruction, it goes one way. You need to show what was the feedback, how was it received by the person that was, was supposed to receive it, what came out of that, how did you close it? That's a communication. But only say I wrote site instructions. You might find that even they were not even considered. You need to show the whole loop in terms of where it started, where did it end, did it achieve what was supposed to be achieved or not? And if not, then the indication must be given in terms of why not. We move further. In terms of um, then we go to group C. Group C is about the impact of the engineering activities that one does. You see now it continues further. Outcome six, outcome seven. C this then for group C. Recognize and address the reasonably foreseeable. You see, it's about you should not have done that. It's to say if you haven't done that, how will you recognize and address those that are foreseeable to be seen? First one critical: social cultural and environmental effects of the level descriptor of the engineering activities that one will be doing. Very, very critical in terms of that. They're not saying, oh, you need to show the work that they're doing. How does it impact the social life of the people? How does it impact the cultural part of the people? How does it affect the environment uh, or, or where the people are living? Outcome seven is meeting all the legal and regulatory requirements and the protection of the health and safety of the persons in the course of level descriptor your engineering activities very important it like the previous one in terms of how do you meet the legal requirements as they are prescribed and the other regulatory requirements in terms the whole part is about the safety of the people in the work that you are doing very very important as well so what this is about is that the registration is about having a comprehensive person that person who will understand the whole part of engineering then we move to group d which has got three outcomes. Group D is about acting ethically, exercising judgment, and taking responsibility. Outcome eight, you see the D there stands for because it's coming from group D is eight, nine, and ten. Conducting engineering activities ethically. Engineering activities. Applicants will say so and so on site wanted to buy a set of tires for me, or they wanted to give me a brown envelope. I bet nowadays it's a white envelope. It's got nothing to do with engineering, it's procurement issues, bribery issues, whatever they call it, you scratch my back, I scratch my back. Here it talks about engineering activities. I'll give a simple example. An over-design is an unethical behavior because by the design standard that has been given with the minimum steel in a column or with the minimum pavement layers in a pavement, that is going to withstand the load that is going to be imposed. The moment you over-design, that is an ethical behavior. So we are looking in things like that. Applicants or graduates or candidates must look to this into this way. What is it, whether knowingly or unknowingly, that might influence my decision that I have to take when I'm doing my work without the influence of the third party or second party? That is the that is the uh, uh, unethical behavior. Exercising self judgment in the course of level descriptor, as they differ as per the category, that is in the case of what is it that you use to make sure that you exercise self judgment. In the work that you do to make sure that the, the decision that you take is hardcore and has been um, taken as such and can be uh, defended for example you can say you use this is a design that has been done before empirical evidence and i've requested from my employer or my supervisor whoever they've checked my work it has been verified third party also made sure that they had a look at it outcome 10 is about the responsible or the responsibility of making decisions on part of all your work in terms of level descriptor again now the responsibility part come in how do you take the responsibility of something that might have gone wrong in that in the work that we have done or that is going to go correct in that work as well the work that is outside your norm who do you conduct because you find that works are, the work that we do in engineering is interrelated do you consult with the specialists that are outside your norm you must indicate that how do you apply the information that come from your education as well to assist you in making the responsible decision in, term, in terms of your work. That's what this is all about. So it forces an applicant or a graduate or a candidate to be a, a, a well-rounded graduate, a well-rounded somebody who's going to be a candidate who's going to register with the Engineering Council of South Africa by virtue of all of these outcomes. Outcome 11 is about the initial professional development. Initial develop professional is the same as CPD. It is called initial because it is looked at that before you get registered as a professional, but it's the same courses. In terms of this, it's about undertaking initial development activities sufficient to maintain and extend your the competence. 
is over and above what you do at work. How do you make sure that you keep abreast with what is happening in your profession? How does one make sure that they've got the philosophy of developing and moving themselves further in terms of that? So it's not only, and remember, it's not only the experience that is gained, it's also about personal development that comes to the person as well. And remember CPD or, or uh, continuous professional development is a requirement now after uh, you are registered or the applicant is registered in terms of the keeping the requirements, same as the driver's license that is required every five years. In here, to maintain it through that is through the CPD. So these are the 11 outcomes in a nutshell of what we talked about that will develop competency. Over and above that, we remember we spoke about the three in one when we say with the national diploma or with the diploma benchmark qualification, what is requested is the three years experience. One year must be at the level of responsible engineer experience. It come from here. So this is how it's measured. First is the you see the level in the table, nature of the work in terms of progression of responsibility, responsibility and level of support. If we look at A, it will see being exposed, nature of the work undergoes induction, observes process of work, competence practitioners, responsibility, no responsibility, accept and pay attention, mentor level of support, mentor explains challenges and forms a solution. So in this case, it, X I would like to see that progression from level A, level B, level C, level D. Level B being assisting, level C being participating, level D being contributing, and level E being performing. Performing is like you are operating like a registered person, although you still have your report into a supervisor, but you are given that free role. That one year, you must be working in a team without supervision, recommending your outputs, responsible but not accountable, because accountability will be taken by a registered person. The level of responsibility to the supervisor will be appropriate to that one of a registered person. And hence, that is a requirement to show that once you get registered, you'll be able to can function on your own. And the applicant uh, candidate takes on problem solving without support, at most with the limited guidance. That must be demonstrated because remember, when you apply, uh, your application is also going to come for the professional review and the reviewers would like to see that during that time. So over and above the progression of responsibility, there's also the level of development. We call it the progression of competency. So you'll see here, inside the training and experience, competency must come out. First is the appreciation, knowledge, experience, and capability. In some of the work, like you saw in, in one of the out, uh, outcomes there, in terms of outcome seven, six, it refers to the foreseeable, something that might happen in terms of affecting environmental effects, culture, and so in social uh, parts of life of the communities in which you'll be doing the work. So some of them, for example, the bill of quantities, not everybody will be able to do the bill of quantities. Not everybody will be working with contracts, but you need to have an appreciation thereof. Knowledge you have because you studied that, you know about them. But experience is critical and capability. The experience is where it is requested that we cannot run away from. It says applicants must indicate that they have independently or under supervision performed the process under consideration experience of the relevant technique and functions must be gained. This is what experience is being looked at. It's not a definition in the Oxford Dictionary, but in terms of the characteristics of how that is going to be measured by the, by the mentors, uh, by the assessors, and by the uh, reviewers in terms of indicating the same equally as for the capability, that the applicant must indicate that they have the capability, independent or at most with limited guidance of performing the process of and making decisions required and also that they have the capability of leading or supervising others in the process. We must also remember that at the end of the day, this is all about making you or the candidate or the applicant or the graduate that they can function on their own after professional decision. It's like giving a licentia that you must go and practice. So this is very, very critical and very important in that context. We just spoke about earlier when we started about the complex engineering problems for the engineers. It's not a, um, a dictionary definition. And I always talk about complex does not mean complicated. EXA uses the characteristics in terms of that. But now as an applicant in the work that you do, you ask yourself questions. And this information can be found in the R-08. Step one, identify the engineering problem. Remember when it started, it said, define, investigate, and analyze outcome one. This is where it starts. The main question, is the problem an engineering problem or not? Criteria that is going to be used is to say, does, have, does solving the problem require in-depth fundamental and specialized engineering knowledge? Now, if that's kind of exists, then it means it's a complex engineering problem. You'll see when you get to the well-defined and broadly defined how they differ 
compared to this. Then the step two as well, in terms of establishing the level of complicity of the initial problem state, what is the nature of the problem? Does it have one or more of the characteristics B, C, or D, as they are indicated here in the criteria? The problem is, is ill-posed and or even over-specified and requires identification and refinement. The problem is high-level problem and includes component parts or sub-problems. The problem is unfair or involved in frequently encountered issues. Now, remember here, we are only showing the part in registration. When you were studying, you will have gone through this in, the, in terms of the graduate attributes that are in your study. So you will have already gained, you know, about what this is required to solve a certain kind of a level descriptor problem or a challenge or an activity. If we move to the next one, which is uh, again moving further from the uh, what, what we just saw. Now, table two refers to, and you can see this is also from ADD02 STAPE, whereby it says now, complex engineers are characterized by the following. The scope of activities may encompass entire complex engineering system or complex subsystems and may extend beyond previous experience, that is unfamiliar scenarios. Where the context, or the, number two, where the context of activities is complex and requires identification and specification, and so on and so on. I guess you'll be you'll get the presentation slides, you can do them better. So it gives you to do a comparison. I always say to gauge or measure yourself, have the three of them open at the same time and measure yourself against them and read them in that context. So if you check now, when we read about the broadly defined for the engineering technologies, how it differs. Step one, criteria. Does solving the problem require coherent and detailed engineering work knowledge underpinning applicable technology area? Because it's about the technologies. The same here in terms of establishing the level of competence uh, complexity in the initial problem. What is the nature of the problem? It must have either of these. The problem is imposed under or even specified and requires identification or refinement to into the technology area compared to the engineer one way speak about the imposed or something that is unfamiliar. Can you see the difference that comes into here now? The same as um, the stem comes here. If you check here, this table two gives the characteristics of how should this be viewed in terms of engineering technologies the the definition or the characteristics of broadly defined you go further to the, the, the well defined for the technician you see this one is even different it says is the problem an engineering problem these are the factors that must be can the problem be solved mainly by practical engineering knowledge that is underpinned by the related theory now coming from the ill post of the complex going to the the technology part of it, when you look at the, I mean, the applicable technology area, when you look at the engineering technologies, looking here as well in terms of the well-defined. So the well-defined, broadly defined complex are not the, the definition in the dictionary. It is the characteristics that are used to measure the kind of work and the kind of experience that goes in there. Same as here you'll see in terms of the nature of the problem. Are largely defined and may require clarification, are discrete, focused, and within engineering systems, and are routine and frequently encountered and may be unfamiliar but in a familiar context so those are the kind of things that i say put them together on the same table and measure the work the kind of work that you are doing and clearly it will indicate under which one are you following if we look at this one you'll see it refers to again the characteristics of that what needs to be read first to say this is the scope of practice that is defined by techniques and the techniques are changed through the adoption of new techniques in the current practice so Reading all of them in that way, it will define that level discrete that we're talking about that. This is how the, the differentiation is made between an engineer, engineering technologist, and an engineering technician. This flow diagram shows um, the process that is followed in terms of registration. At EXA, I'll just talk about it in summary. The first part here you see about candidates. We spoke about it coming from an accredited qualification or after the educational background is done from those that are not accredited by EXA. Then they will, they will register as, um, as candidates or can be refused. That's simple. Coming to the professional part of it, the when the, ap the application will be made, when the application of an applicant arrives at exam, it will be divided into it will be divided into four. It is sent to the virtual panel members, and those panel members do not know that they have got the application. They are called assessors, and then they will do the evaluation of the of the of the. Um, what you call experience appraisal at that stage on paper. And then the ideal or the likelihood that can come is to say applicant pass the experience appraisal, they may proceed to the next stage, the next stage, which is the professional review. So then EXA will appoint a moderator. A moderator is an experienced assessor who will also do an assessment and check 
the four outcomes that were done by those four assessors. Once that is done and approved that in an ideal situation, then the moderator will also recommend support the recommendation of the four assessors. Now, the moderator in the older process is the arbiter, is the one who makes the decision. And then it will go to the next level of professional review. At the professional review, the applicant will meet three reviewers at times, uh, but the policy allows for two reviewers as well uh, in cases where the third one is unable to attend. But the three reviewers in an ideal situation then will interview at the professional level, which is compulsory, will interview the applicant to verify that that what is on the application form in paper, assessed by the four people, assessors and moderated by the one moderator, is the true reflection of the experience of this candidate or the applicant. Then if it goes through, then the application, applicant, the outcome of the interview will be sent to the two assessors. The two assessors, now the, the reviewers are the experienced moderators and experienced um, assessors. Now, Exa will appoint another two now, no longer one, the, the one moderator that was from the experience appraisal, but appoint two moderators now after the professional review. Now, these moderators are in categories. There's the one that will be by virtue of experience, be for the experience appraisal, and these ones now are for the professional review. Then they will, if in an ideal situation, go they support. What they do, they also check from the day one when this application was assessed until the professional review. And then they will give their, they, they will give the, remember the recommendation is made by the reviewers. They will give a decision. They are the arbiter in the process. Then the applicant will be registered. That is in an ideal situation. In a situation whereby at an experience appraisal, the assessors find and the moderator find that the applicant lacks information that might allow the, the applicant to proceed. They will request that the applicant submit either the information in writing or be called for the experience appraisal interview to deduce that information from the applicant. And at times it's found that the, the applicant does not meet the requirements at that stage or the applicant still lacks experience. Then it's only at that stage at the experience appraisal that the applicant will be set into abeyance. Abeyance is to say, go and gain more experience within 12 uh, months period and apply at a certain stage as well. And then going back to that ideal situation after those one, after the experience appraisal, it follows the same route that I've indicated earlier. At times whereby then the applicant is refused registration after professional review, they've got the right to appeal. And that appeal will be heard um, by EXA, by EXA counsel, and then if the needs be, then it will go to CBE, then it will follow the, the normal process of going further and further. But EXA has built also a buffer in there to say to the applicants that uh, they don't receive, they are refused registration at professional review, that they can come for what they call, um, it, you know, that interview whereby they explain where it went wrong in terms of the advisory interview, where they advise in terms of what is lacking in the applicant, although the applicant is, has got the right to appeal, but before that. Now, that is very, very important in terms of understanding the intrigues of what goes into the professional registration. So that is in a nutshell in terms of the, the registration process at EXA. Moving further in terms of how one will see the certificate, this uh, I think is also available on the EXA website, not to check to check that you don't find, because EXA uses the digital registration certificates now with that barcode as well. So they don't offer the hard copy certificates as well. So everything is given there to check in terms of authenticating that this registration certificate is correct. And the people that are responsible for their, their, their contact numbers are given here, as you can see on this slide, in terms of verifying when you receive this, that is not the registration certificate that is valid or not. You can contact EXA in that regard. Moving further in terms of um, the, we spoke about the International Engineering Alliance. It's also a presentation on its own. Um, EXA is a signatory to the International Engineering Alliance in terms of the educational accords in the Washington Accord for the Engineers, the Sydney Accord for the Engineering Technologies, and the uh, Dublin Accord for the Engineering Technicians. The names there are the towns in which the meeting was held where those accords were signed. And then over and above that, EXA is also a member of the professional competency agreements. First one being the International Professional Engineer or IPA that links with the Washington Accord. Then you also have AITA, which is the International Engineering Technologist Agreement that links with the Sydney Accord for the Engineering Technologist. And we've got the latest one that was established in, nine, in 2016, which is AIT, which is the Agreement of International Engineering Technician that links with the Dublin Accord. 
So EXA participates in all of those in terms of the international register for professional reg uh, registration. So what happens when the applicant is registered on the national register after a minimum of three years? They need to register on the international register after including the three years, minimum seven years post-qualification experience so that they can uh, come on the international register. It's a country like, as you can see here, they keep their own section of the international register within a, its own jurisdiction, like EXA as a jurisdiction in terms of the IA requirements. You'll see here, once registered on those registers, this is the postnomial. Then one would be PRN plus INTEPESA for the engineering technologies will be INT International Engineering Technologies. SA will be the country for Australia will be AUS, US will be United States, UK will be UK. So that's how they differentiate that this person is on the international register as part section of the uh, the, necessary, the the relevant jurisdiction in terms of that. If we move further in terms of um, what is required to become on the international register, as I've indicated there, the applicant uh, to meet those competence agreement standards uh, must demonstrate that they've met the following requirements. One, if the academic qualification are created or recognized by EXA, including those recognized through relevant course for that category. Now, remember, the recognized by EXA comes to your qualification if it was not accredited. It came through that merit number three and four, whereby substantial equivalence was done, because now you've already registered with EXA with that qualification. It's going to be used further. And the requirements says that it must be registered with EXA in the relevant category have minimum of seven years. So it means that it's the three years that you have at the minimum that you use plus the four years. After that. So you need four years after registering uh, with EXA to meet this requirement. Hence, they say practical experience of seven years. No longer uh, now, it's again, no longer one year in the responsible position, two years to indicate that we're in a charge of significant engineering work and again maintaining your continuous professional development at that satisfactory level. So that's how you get on the international register. That's how it differs. So this one uh, is the same as the same slide as the previous one in terms of the requirements of seven years and two years and maintaining the CPD. And again, this is what the, the application form is about. It, you must uh, complete your prescribed application form, the experience report, summary of experience reports, reference reports, record of the CPD and the application fee uh, so that you can um, the applicant can come on the international register. So over and above that, X, over and above the International Engine Alliance, EXA uh, came into what you call the mutual recognition agreements with other signatories. For example, they've got um, the mutual agreement with Engineers Australia, Engineers Ireland, and the Engineering Council UK, in which they recognize each other's professional registration. So if you are registered in one of these jurisdictions, the EXA uh, recognize each other in such that uh, the people that are at least a certain period of each of the parties of these agreements will be accorded the corresponding registration of another of other on the recipe of a duly completed acceptable application form. And if you look at the Engineers Australia, it's all the all the disciplines and all categories. Engineers Islands is the same. With Engineering Council UK is only civil engineering and it's only for professional engineers. So that is what um, over and above IEA, the mutual agreement that have been signed by EXA are there on the international level. This is just to show the mutual the relationship between the voluntary associations. Voluntary associations are recognized by the Act, a state uh, in the Engineering Profession Act, and that collaboration is required so that the work of the professional societies or those that are at the call phase, being the VAs or the voluntary associations, can fit into this regulatory body, which is the Engineering Council of South Africa, or this uh, statutory body, because they are at a far reaching end, but the work that needs to be done guiding uh, applicants or graduate or the candidate is done at the VA level. Okay, so we should be nearly reaching there. So we are there at the end of uh, our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Barry, I see we still have another four slides. I'm not sure if. Uh, uh, I think those are just for me. Um, yeah, but uh, oh, they will. Okay. Just a few questions that came through as um, you were presenting. So we'll see if you can be able no problem. to yeah. cover that. And um, yes. yeah, so just for everyone to see our upcoming uh, courses, um, there you can just go on our website and just go on the schedule to see um, the courses that will be starting soon. 
and um, just to touch base on our upcoming webinars. Uh, so we have another one that is coming tomorrow. So if you are interested, you can just go and um, register for that one. Um, I'm not sure if we can have more questions for Mr. Jones. I am here. Yeah, I think if you can just check on the on the chat line, there's a few that are uh, coming through. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what the questions are. So many. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, let me see. I see some of them are, are not the questions as per se, but let's to be fair. Yeah. Um, Let's start the beginning. Okay. Anyone a sound from the last bit? Okay. Yeah. So for no sound. Okay. It was the earlier in the morning. Apologies for the connection that we had, the challenges we had earlier in the morning. The questions. The questions have started. Okay. Just looking for Questions. If I miss your question that you has asked it, I'm checking on the chat. Okay. So I see there's a question here. Okay, here we are. This was still about the sounds. I'm checking now. Um, I'm filtering through them. All right. Yeah, okay, this was just confirmation. Will you share the presentation? I can hear you guys have sound. Are individuals who complete an MEng with EIT able to register as a professional engineer? Ultimately, it's from uh, William van Merve. Remember, the, there are two ways to register with EXA with the MEng. Um, at the current state, coming from the in the technology route it will mean the owners or the postgraduate diploma plus the mng that is accredited by exa as per e-22 pe competency standard so that is a cognate that will be required not mng only you need to have as a cognate of either the owners or the pgdp which is the uh, postgraduate diploma in engineering as per the exa requirements now the other part using the m -Eng on its own like that you'll have to go through the e17p process which is the qualification substantial uh, qualification evaluation that will be done by the education department nothing stops to use any other combination of qualifications uh, with regards to that to do it uh, in that regard but exa will look into in that way and the other one these are not comments the other one is dark do candidates applying through accredited accords get approved directly against the equivalent registration category e.g uk chartered engineer or australia chartered engineer becomes extra professional engineer yes but the the whole idea with the accords was to recognize each other's qualification for in terms of mobility but over and above that the signatories will i mean the jurisdictions will have their own way of dealing for example if you register you come from they already registered with the engineering council uk is a chartered engineer or incorporated engineer or engineering technician and then you want to come on the international register of exa or register with exa you need to understand the laws in the country in every country where you go they'll request it the technical part of your engineering might not be necessarily assessed because that is in place we follow the same standard as you saw in the morning what, what i was presenting but you'll have to comply with their requirements in terms of if you have to go through and do something so that you can be on the international register or register with them that needs to be followed as such the other one can we register with exa if you hold an eit undergraduate certificate um that shall have to be checked with exa some of the questions that you are asking are more administrative related that i would not know and i'll request that uh, you send them to exa i think their email is easy engineer at exa.co.za or you can find that on the website uh, William van der William van der say at Dirk, it does not appear that this is a clear cut from personal interaction with other institutions. They still, you still need to formal application. Yes, that's what I was talking about. You still need to be interviewed to meet the requirements uh, in the 
in the require in the in the jurisdictions. We learn from the slide 18. If a candidate is registered in a category X, obtain a higher level qualification that qualifies for registration in higher registration category. Does the minimum of three years still apply even if the candidate has been working simultaneously? Yes, it still apply because uh, you are you're in a different category. Now it comes when. The question that normally comes is if you had a national diploma, for example, and now all of a sudden you want to register that as a technologist, why, what may you do to operate at a technologist level? And if you can answer that question, then it's fine. Many times it's found that it's not. Hence, XI is saying you won't be able to do it in a three years time. They give you eight years to develop because they say you don't have the educational competencies that will allow you to do it immediately. You need to go through the experience to build up that. Hence, they require eight years and five years minimum of, uh, prof of uh, at the level of responsible engineering. Uh, Leroy Williams uh, at Berry Dakota, uh, can we register with EXA with an IIT advanced diploma and QF7? As I've said, those ones will need to be directed to EXA. And then with a diploma, I need minimum eight years to register as a professor in technology. Yes, it's in Mulong Moluti. That's true with the five years inside the eight years at the responsible engineering level. See, Role Precious Longwani, if you did advanced diploma, what are you qualified for? Advanced diploma is at NQF level seven, so it's for engineering technologists. Divet, uh, hashtag two, uh, just quick, too quick, I missed that now. What happened? Uh, Okay, I download the presentation with the download button on top of this presentation. Oh, okay. So Betty was asking that to we'll still share the presentation. People are saying thank you. Bongani Mr. PR and how does one become an S assessor at EXA? You shall need to contact EXA at their I think this is registrations at exa.co.za. You'll be able to can answer on that one. The email is registrations at exa.co.za. Uh, God's will, does one have to wait for three years to register as a professional if you have registered as a candidate and have experience prior to obtaining? No. Remember, candidate, candidate registration is not uh, compulsory. So you can register if you if you deem to be registrable, even uh, that you only registered for candidacy last year or yesterday. You can register if you've got minimum three years, you'll be evaluated. According to my understanding, in order to register the PRN from BTEC route, the candidate must do MH professional from EIT in order to be eligible. Okay, that answers that. Can someone who's registered, that is Ishak, who's as a PR tech with over 40 years experience in building structures and have an MSc civil engineering, MSc international construction, manage, apply for PRN? Nothing stops you to apply with EXA for anything. Your qualifications that are not accredited by EXA will be evaluated for substantial equivalence. Yes, you can, but those it means that they will have to be evaluated. Tembalikle Nanyua, do I have to wait for three years to get responsible if I apply for as a candidate engineer? Candidate engineer is immediately after qualification. Three years is post-qualification when you register for professional status. Divert to, is there any category at EXA for IT infrastructure? No. My lady Silepe, thank you. Okay, was asking Sanili Siwe. Tatanyana Adegu, I have an advanced diploma of plant engineering. Can I register as a technologist, uh, engineer technologist at EXA? You need to check with EXA with that, with that one because EXA have got certain qualifications that they have accredited. I'm not sure about the other one. You need to check with EXA. They send an email to phone them, request for the relevant department that can assist you with regards to that. Okay, Barry was indicated we'll be sharing uh, the, the slides. And then did I miss another one here? Okay. Uh, okay, Barry was telling me that we'll have this question. So it's an issue. As far as I know, the candidate baseline must actually be an MN civil engineering and not MSC to apply for PR Eng from PR Tech Eng. Remember, over and above the streamlined ideal situation of MNG, not MSC, there's also the, the alternative route of um, qualification evaluation. So nothing stops to use any other qualification or a combination thereof. Apply to EXA rather than they will let you know. See, post 2, 
if it's N3 to N6 electrical engineering plus electrical pay test, how long do they wait to register at EXA? Rather check with EXA on that one is more an admin part of it. Now, let us let MNG professional from EIT. When is the next intake? Or oh, that is more to you. Or MNG chemical berry, I think that is more to you. So they said, Darren, I do sound is dropping. Very recorded. I will be okay. Can you please explain group C part six? Again, I did not get that explanation. So group C uh, refers to the impact of the work that is being done by the uh, professional. So how does your work impact the environment, for example? How does your work have impact on the social part of life of the people? How does work your work impact the cultural part of the life of the people? Over and above that, what are the foreseeable challenges that your work might have in terms of the same? And again, if you go further, the legal and the regulatory requirement that you apply in your work must be also demonstrated that you use certain laws to get your work or certain regulations in terms of Group C. That is the impact of the work that you do in terms of foreseeable challenges and the legal requirements or laws that you do. Now, let us let me check this link, uh, but I you know, okay, that's for the intake. I hold the national and diploma trade test as a wireman and wireman's license, 10 years working experience as electrical supervisors, five years as acting district engineer. Exa declined my application for candidate professional engineering technician. Please help. Um, I'm not sure what kind of help are you looking for. Please contact Exa again. Maybe explain that further. They should have given reasons why they have declined it. Can I register as PRNG with the MNG from EIT? Some of this needs to be directed to EXA. Hey, one thing that I need to clarify, I do not work for EXA, although I'm on council and I do this kind of work for EXA. I've been doing this kind of work for EXA in uh, accreditation, in the registration, in education, uh, in the investigating committee for uh, code of conduct and other work that I've done for EXA. I've been sitting at the international for, the, uh, for eight years on the IEA governing group. Um, I do not work for X. I volunteer my time to carry out this mandate. I've been doing this since October 2006 for the Engineering Council of South Africa. Some of your questions are more administration related that we need to get clarification from EXA. Zwani Tessele, so EIT bachelor's degrees regulation time is three years, but it's, it is a BSc. Where does EXA categorize it in terms of engineering profession, PR eng or PR tech eng? That shall need to be uh, ask from EXA. Uh, these are the only ones that I presented that are from what EXA has recognized. Can you please get this presentation? Okay, I think that uh, Bedia will answer. And let's see, check out this guy. He has helped a number of candidates uh, with your credential for credentials for EXA. So they have given uh, the, the link in address of the person. For your men's. If you are registered as a candidate technician years back, but I'm, I'm going to be penalized plus minus 9,000 when I apply for professional engineering technician. I was talking about the ideal. Those ones in that regard, you need to check with EXA if they've canceled you to come back. What, needs to, what do you need to do? Pilanim Kize, please give clarity. If you can register as a PRN with MN if you, have took, if you took the route of investing of technology, not traditional investing. Yes, as indicated on the... E-23 PE diagram one, figure one, in terms of the cognate and the combination of qualifications. But always check that your qualifications, if I'm not recognized by EXA, you apply for qualification evaluation, there will be evaluations. There was, uh, this one was the uh, downloading. You can download the presentation. Okay, thank you, Sam. Tell us your blessing. My ears. The last time I checked this presentation, usually I watch CPD points. I just wanted to know if the same applies when it is delivered through an online platform, check with EXA on that one. I did this one for others. Yes, I do not know. Frank can make you okay. We'll get a presentation. And this one is a very loaded question. Let's see. Okay. Um, a provisional accredited program as good as accredited program. Can one register in a provisional accredited program? As Mvuselelo Makatini can act. Can candidate that have BTEC and MNs both in electrical engineering before the level NQ8 changes have been registered as PRNG? You need to apply for any other qualification that is not accredited by EXA. Nothing stops you to apply for qualification evaluation so that they can substantial, 
equivalent it and tell you in which category can you register. So you can do that, yes. And then Tabo, how does one apply to register for the international register? As I've indicated on the presentation, I think you saw it, the question came before we finished. You must first be registered with the EXA. You must have minimum seven years experience, a uh, post qualification. You must have minimum two years of uh, acting in a of working in a responsible engineering level. Jomozi Nkwashu, are there any institutions that offer an engineering master's program that is aligned with the EXA E-22 PE, specifically in mechanical engineering? Check with EXA or check with the universities themselves in the country. Zidroxen Bredenkamp, I just want clarification because some say that one cannot register for a professional engineer when we have an EIT BSc degree. So also said that we need an EIT master to be able to register as a professional engineer. Is this true or we will be able to register as professional engineer if we have an EIT BSc degree? Uh, rather direct this one to EXA. Phone them, check their education department and registration department. They'll advise better. I know the email at registration is registrations at exa.co.za, but you can phone them and they will assist you. Carlo, step two, holding the advanced diploma in electrical and instrumentation. Does this register you under both trades? Remember, exa does not have the trade. It's a profession. As I said, trade and occupation falls under QCTO, which is the qualification, uh, the, the quality, quality council for trade and occupations. But you can use those qualifications and apply for, quali for a, a qualification evalu uh, substantial equivalence and see where that will throw you with EXA. Robert F., good morning. Good morning to you too, Robert. Can we get a brief summary of which NQF levels will allow registration as a professional engineer, technologist, technician? For example, with an NQF level 7 qualification, what registration will you qualify for? Uh, Robert F., check E-23PE M&P document on EXA. And when you page down figure one, it shows all the NQF levels and the relevant um, exit route for professional registration. As far as I know, NQF level six uh, will lead to professional registration as a candidate engineering technician. NQF level seven, both on the advanced diploma and the BNS Tech uh, Bachelor of Engineering Technology, engineering technologist. When you move further, the honors and the PGDP, postgraduate diploma, on their own, they lead to no way. But plus the cognate of MNG which is at NQF level nine, they lead to candidate engineering and uh, candidate engineer. But check that E-23P, many thanks. Thanks to you too. Harry Pinar, PR Technique Eng, registered already. I've been professional registered with Excess since 2012. I've also been running a structural civil engineering firm since 2016, including all aspects. What process do I need to go through? Grade my registration category from PR Eng to, you don't upgrade uh, Harry, you register in a different category. You apply same as you have applied for PR Techni. Remember, for PR Techni, you are operating at well-defined level. At professional engineering technologies, you must be operating at the broadly defined level, as you saw those characteristics that I was showing. Uh, is it Tate or Tate? It talks about the home affairs says foreign candidates must be registered as professional to get a critical skills permit. And exercise candidates must have experience first to be registered as professionals. How do you expect those candidates who graduated in South Africa to have experience if they are not allowed to work in South Africa? Don't you see that EXA and Home Affairs are contradicting themselves? EXA wants someone with experience to get permit, but to get the experience, Home Affairs is not allowing candidates to work without permit. That is an administrative question, Tate or Tate, that you need to direct to EXA. Please call them. They'll be able to can assist on that one. Can you register as PR engine with an EIT master's? Again, please check with EXA. I've got limited information about that. Uh, that's from Jabulani. Camille, so does one need a minimum of one year performing as a candidate engineer with little to no supervision? Yes, so that you can meet level E progression. Daniel Mamona, I'm a chief engineer loading multidiscipline teams of engineers with more than 14 years working experience with an international mining organization holding BTEC in civil engineering, holding MSc in civil engineering from UK official institution, holding MSc in engineering management from UK official institution, actually completing B and tech honors and completing advanced diploma of plant engineering EIT. What category should I register to? Your advice, please. Your choice, um, Daniel. 
it is your choice in terms of that. Please uh, conduct, get in touch with EXA so that they can advise. But remember, it must come from, they can only advise with where you want to register in which category. Uh, apologies if I don't pronounce the surname correctly. I see it's Greg Piotrowski. Has anyone managed to register with EXA using EIT Advanced Diploma? I do not know. Maybe this question is also directed to the attendees today. Daniel Mamona, again, what about MN Special Program SPX requirements? Where is it offered in South Africa? Rather check with EXA, Bongani, Sochani, PRN. How does one register as an assessor with EXA? As I said, send the email to registrations at EXA, then they will contact you back. They'll, they'll give you the information. Itumele Mako, the CPD points attained before registration count? Yes, they do count. But remember, before registration, they will be only counting for your registration um, as a, uh, in that regard. So after that, once you are registered, you need to accumulate them uh, every year. So, Lufelo, do candidates have to pay annual fees or the candidate and fees only for everyone pays annual fees? If you check on the EXA website, you'll see the difference in the annual fees. Sirole so Precious Klongwani again is step four. Well, I was informed I am quantifying qualifying for technician after my advanced diploma, whereas advanced diploma is in line with technologies. Uh, I'm not clear with the question. Well, I was informed I am qualifying for technician after my advanced diploma, whereas advanced diploma is in line with technologies. Yes, advanced diploma is at NQF level seven. It leads to the exit registration as a candidate engineering uh, technician. Daniel Mamona, is the end from EIT accredited by EXA? I do not know. I only know that on the EDES 23 PE, EXA only accredits up to MNG professional as per EDES 22 PE. But you need to check with EXA. It might be something that happened. As I said, I do not work for EXA, but um, I've got the inside intimate knowledge of the happenings at EXA as I always do this kind of um, voluntary work for them. Are there any examples of TERs we can access? Remember, as per this Camille, yeah, you are not allowed to do that because of the Pro Protection of Personal Information Act prohibits that. You can uh, develop your own. In the TERs, the guidelines are given and the requirement in, this, in which they need to be written that are straightforward. So follow that as such. And always be very careful of referring to what others have done because you might be tempted to write how they have done. Treat your own situation as a unique situation as it deems fit. You'll be advised if, you've, if you did not do it correctly. Moving further, um, please clarify data, Serole Precious Tomani, Debohon Dombela, hashtag two. Is there any special treatment that one will get when applying to be a professional engineer if I graduated from Australia as compared to if graduated from in South Africa? As I've indicated, R-01 POL policy gives everything that has to do with that. Please read that. Depending that if you are if you are registered uh, in Australia. But if your qualification is Washington Accord aligned and that is accepted, it's going to be, so it's already taken as a graduate, it's, it's an accredited qualification. Remember, when I presented for bullet point number two, it's about accredited qualifications inside the accords. So they'll be, you'll be treated like your qualification has been accredited. Okay, moving further. Kukanya Kwenkosi, usually EIT webinars provide a certificate of attendance at the end of the webinar. Will any certificate be? issued to attendees for this webinar and will that certificate carry any cpd points i think that is more for barry i was registered with exa with engineer australia but exa said my qualification is provisional why i would not know you need to uh, ask that from the education department inside exa that's Bethlehemu. rebaune mahakhani which institution offer bridging MN program for PR and registration in South Africa? Check with EXA and or with the institutions as well. Kukanya Gwengkosi, please give clarity on if you can register as a PR and with MN if you took a route of university or technology, not traditional university. Yes, you can because that MN is in fact is, is in fact supposed to be offered by the those that offer the engineering technology qualifications. That's in South Africa, you've got four comprehensive. That offer that, that is Nelson Mandela University, uh, UNISA, University of South Africa, University of Johannesburg, and Walter Sisulu. And you've got the four universities of technology, Swan University of Technology, and then Valley University of Technology, Central University of Technology, Mango City University of Technology, Devon University of Technology, and Central University, I mean, uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. So those uh, six offer 
the engineering related qualification plus the four comprehensives that I've mentioned. Uh, some tips, Sam. When kept in abeyance, do you need to write a new report with a different project or it should be the same project you wrote about the initial submission? Good question. When you are in your bias, it means that you did not read, you did not, you did not meet the level in which you'll be applying for, for example, the complex level that of the work. So the expectation is that you are given the opportunity to meet, to operate at the correct level. It doesn't matter. It can be the same project now that you are working at a higher level. Yes, you need to submit a new report. You'll be guided and a referee report as well. But it's not the entire application because XI is already your application. Dirk, why is only PRN category approved with the UK Council? That is the historic council they, in terms of the mutual agreement that they had in the past. We don't, I don't know what the history was with regards to that. Tilen Govenda, how does registration without supervision from mentor differ from one with a mentor? Um, remember, the ideal situation of the mentor is what we're talking about. If you do not have a mentor that's can uh, indicate your experience and competence. What, so, so the mentor is not a necessity. It depends on many of the of the of the. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we go to Bekumzi Vilani. How do the Engineering Voltaire Association do? Rather check on their web their website. Most of them uh, have how they operate. These are the professional societies that are recognized by X. And I know that if you are a member in one of them, then you get discount when you apply register with EXA. Demister Mulisani, can I register as a PRN with a BTEC a me a mechanical and MNG and both done at TUT? Uh, the fact that some of the qualifications that you have, so for the BTEC will lead to professional engineering technologist, MNG if it's not um, accredited by EXA, then sub submit a combination of qualification for uh, educational background evaluation at EXA, they will, they will indicate you. And then that is, uh, is it Garnet or Hanat Sneiman? F. Tangwani, F. Jones, Mulesan, good day, Mr. Mulesan. I currently hold both an advanced diploma in civil engineering and a BTEC in environment. And I'm, 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 I am considering a master's degree as a means of attaining PR eng. What is articulation process? E-23 PE, extra document figure one, have got the articulation process. I'd rather check that. But remember, any qualification that is not accredited by EXA will have to go, you have to apply for educational evaluation as a combination with what you have, and they will advise much easier in terms of where can you register. Paco Anderson, I'm completing, I'm a completing student from the University of Botswana. Am I eligible to register with EXA? Majority of courses covered where, where EXA accredited. Remember, over and above, I refer to bullet number three and four. For those qualifications that are not accredited by EXA, your qualification will be evaluated for substantial equivalence to an accredited qualification in South Africa. Yes, you can register. How many CPD points do we need to be able to register? Uh, for when you are a candidate, it's not specified, but you must have done CPD. The, the minimum five comes once you are registered that you must attain every year. Mashudu three, that's coming. Mashudu three, is it possible to register PRN after obtaining BN Tech honors? Uh, it's a very tricky question because it depends. BNG Tech Honours, if you follow the qualification route, must be plus the MNG as per E-22 PE document. BNG Tech Honours leads to no registration, but you can submit other qualifications that you have, and EXA will look at the combination of qualifications. But as it stands here, no. Yako, uh, Stack 3, what is the easiest route I can register as PRNG having more than 10 years experience? Is to apply for substantial equivalence if you don't have the... The, the necessary qualifications that are benchmarked or accredited, apply with those qualifications for substantial equivalence, then you take it from there. You'll be advised by X in terms of what will be the next step. And then we've got Sizwes Zikalala hashtag two. If someone studied in a foreign institute, what is we what is that is not part of the Washington Accord and their qualification has been accredited by SAQA, can they register with X as a PR engine? As I said, remember. Your qualification needs to be evaluated by EXA for substantial equivalence. It doesn't matter, as I've indicated earlier, that bullet number three is to cater for those that studied abroad and that are necessarily not necessarily accredited by EXA. The wonder, so with EIT Advanced Diploma of Industrial Automation, which category can I register? Rather check with EXA on that one because it's not part of their approved categories, but check with them. Nebuham Munyai, 
attending CPD courses while registered as a candidate, does this count courses count only worthwhile after registering, not after registering, you use them before registering, and then they'll be taken further uh, from there. Okay, uh, Ridwan is asking for the TERs, is it a requirement that the report is 2,000 words per outcome or 2,000 in total? I'll have to verify that Ridwan, I cannot just say top of my head, just check, but I know in the TER, they normally request uh, 100 words per, sex, per that section in the TER, but we need to verify on the application form. Rinae Museneke, if you have completed your national your diploma and worked as a contractor and decided to do a B and will I still require a minimum of three years? Remember, the minimum of three years is post qualification. Sometimes you find that you've got the experience that is prior to that, then it will fall under, under bullet number four, recognition of prior learning. But you need to stipulate it clearly when you apply. Samulum Tombeni, what is EXA doing in order to ensure that graduate engineers are not only stuck in modeling or drafting positions as organizations tend to appoint individuals based on what skill role they do they need? That needs to go direct to EXA. Please call them and ask that direct to them. Kwezi, how long does it take on average for you to be assessed for PR and I would not know it's more administration inside EXA. One thing I need to guard against is that EXA relies on the volunteers from industry. So I would not know about that, that process. Semi, that question was coming from Kwezi. Semi, it is Shemi Khan, Manikas. Can a national and diploma from TVET College for Civil Engineering be considered for a candidate civil engineering technician technologist? You need to submit that to EXA for substantial equivalence that they evaluate it and they tell you because at current it is not, but nothing stops you to submit so that you get guidance from EXA. But Tabile, how does EXA deal with applications where qualifications were obtained in countries that do not form part of their course? As I've indicated, you can apply, you'll do substantial equivalence over and above those that are not from their course or are accredited by EXA. Mutladile, how many reports required in order to register as a PR engine if you have a technical experience for three years as a male right artisan after completed degree, then you now are registered as a candidate engineer. Does the experience count? Uh, the report, I'm not sure what you mean by that. You, the application form has got what you call engineering report that you need to complete. It's only one engineering report. Tanzikolo Ngindana, is it possible for B and step on us and to have level eight quali qualified candidate to the PR and no? It needs a cognate of M and they go together as a whole qualification, both of them. But if you've got other qualifications, do you submit for, to EXA for a combination of qualifications for evaluation. Kheripinar, PR Techni Eng. Also, adding to my question, my previous question, which courses at EIT can or should I enroll for with my current qualification and deal with some BTEC subject that I've completed to be registered as a PR Eng? And my, will my previous courses credit be taken into account? That is more directed to EXA. Fortune Mukoni, if I register as a candidate engineer, do, do they send me a hard copy of my certificate or will it be? It is an electronic copy. They don't offer hard copy certificates anymore. Good day. I have experience. I have experience working for a water board as a head of engineering. I don't have direct design experience, but with experience, I have mastered the pressure dynamics and design parameters of transfer of bulk. Water services, do I qualify to register as a PR? Uh, yes, I I'm not sure which PR are you referring to their various. You've got professional engineering technician, engineering technologist, and engineer. EIT, Linus, EIT needs to engage with ENC, Engineering Council of Namibia, that is more to bury. Tumelo Malebana, does EXA provide you with a mentor or supervisor after registering as a candidate? No, it's the responsibility of the candidate. Prime. Mamukhani. So as a candidate engineer, if someone relocates to another country, will EXA consider those three years experience outside South Africa? That is more an administration question to EXA. I registered four years ago as an engineering candidate and haven't kept up with my payments. Can I still apply for PR Tech? That's Mohammed Ayes Malik. Check with EXA is an administrative question. Patrick, can I get into international register if I have more than seven years experience but never registered with EXA? No. You have first of the requirement, you must be registered with EXA. Then the rest follows. Kilani Mkize, thank you for the response regarding MH qualification. It makes sense. Thank you so much. Kamil, you need to get your own and sign mentorship agreement with your mentor. Thanks for that. That's what I was saying. 
Carol Muila questions. Uh, Frankie at Lina's, they are at advanced level already. Mornay Smith, I'm currently studying. How do I know if the university I'm learning with registered with EXA? It's not registered with EXA, Mornay. Check on the EXA website for the qualifications that have been uh, accredited by EXA. It's E 20 PT or PE or uh, PN. E 20. If you check on the EXA website, they list the qualifications and the universities of the qualifications accredited. They register the, the EXA accredited programs, not departments and not the universities. Saneli Siwe, Ed Berry, Dakota EIT, course advisor, Jones Mills in South Africa, are there any universities at the moment offering MNG as part of the Trinity EXA requirement to enable? I do not know. Check with EXA or with the universities themselves. Linus and Frankie, thank you, bro. Okay, something. Paco Anderson, the four city. I'm completing. I'm a completing student from the, I think we have answered this one. Uh, this one is uh, the name. I'm, apologies if I don't read it correct. Nioniringie Jindidu. Uh, is there a significance of attendance that is to bury Uche? I did a national diploma in Nigeria, which is NQF level seven, and did M in South Africa. What am I qualified to register? What do you want to register for? It must come from you, Uche. Frank Linus, uh, for now, also register with EXA Carabo. So once you have attended diploma, no matter the number of years of experience, you'll be allowed to register as a technologist. Yes. One delay. Hi, sir. Can I use my mentor registered as my referee and two additional referee and registered for professor? They require at least two registered referees. I mean, two, two extra registered referees. The third one maybe might be not registered, but they must, they must be registered. Carol Muila, if I have gaps in my experience, how does this affect my process? Of it does not because uh, things happen in life, you might have been without the work, you might have gone for maternity, you might have done this, but you need to indicate that, that why did you, why was the gap? As long as you meet the, the years that are requested. Carabo, so once you have the advanced diploma, no matter the number, yes. Uh, Lina Sprengel, please forward this to course. Okay, Terry, Mukari, Terry Mukari, if one translate from BNs tech owners and BNs owners offered by UP, does such an individual meet the academic requirement to register as a PRN? No, on the on the ideal situation is only if you submit a quali um, combination of qualification and extra evaluates that. So, but the way they are, because they remember the, the, the UPB and owners is not uh, um, accredited by EXA for registration. It's for the academia purposes. EXA at UP will register their BNG. That's it because they are they are aiming for PRNG. Anything postgraduate, they it's not, but any qualification that is not uh, accredited by EXA will need to be submitted to EXA for qualification evaluation. Ishak Losal, no. Kukanya Kwenkosi, I have a foreign BNG and MNG from VEST to have qualified to apply for PRNG. As I said, submit your qualification combination of qualification, let the education department and EXA do evaluation, they'll let you know. Okay, others will talk about the sound issue. Yes, that's when the presentation reference, what is advanced? Lynette, what is the advantage of having candidates if not compulsory? It's more to the fees. If you're not a candidate, when you apply first, you pay almost 9,000. If you are a candidate, you pay almost 4,000 something. So you score 5,000. But it's also good to be a candidate because you follow the process as per R-04 PE. You get guided. Many apply directly and they've got struggled because they've never followed the, the necessary requirements. But at the moment, it's not compulsory. But is there something that is there to assist? Linus? Check with the rather upper. Okay, when I start preparing for my presentation after submitting the report, when do I start preparing for my presentation after submitting the report? EXA will guide you when you have to go for the interview. That's label. A viewer, Sijadu, can one apply for candidate engineer and candidate engineer after three years of graduating of BTEC? It is it's immediately when you get a qualification to apply for candidacy. And again, if you don't apply immediately, after a one year, EXA charges you the higher amount. Come in. The register fees inc uh, fees increase the longer you wait to register. Yes, that's true. Thanks, Camille, for that. You can have a foreign B and M and from VEST to have qualified that I've answered. Pinilam Pilanum Kize still need a master's to allow okay the answering. And Irfan, how do you register as a professional engineer for direct manager and supervisor? It's not graduate, it's not registered with EXA. I'm not following that one. Mbulani Kikana. I'm doing B and Tech honors in adoption engineering. Can I register as a candidate technologist in computer engineering discipline? 
you don't need an honors for that you need a b and tech honors does not lead to any registration it only this registration plus the m -Eng to candidate engineer for computer science i'm not sure some of these are which one they consider at exa check with exa Veronica Mvula, a viewer said was asking by how much. Check the EXA website for the list of fees. Veronica Mvula, as an EXA kind of engineer, but I'm working in another country. How do I obtain a mentor? And I'm required to work in SA for three years to apply. It's not necessarily to work in SA, but in kind of such questions, rather check with EXA. Jan van der Vestagen obtained a national diploma in 1997 and PR technique in 2007 with more than 12 experience in responsible position. Obtained BTEC in 2021. Will I apply for PR and PRN tech via the alternative route. Uh, yes, you can. It's PR tech eng, not the other way around. The way you wrote it. Yes, you can. Putin can want to register for candidate technician with N5 and 6 diploma college. Rather check with EXA. You need to submit that for qualification evaluation because it's not recognized by EXA now, so that they can do that. VJ Nandal Nandlang. Is there any registration category for mine ventilation engineers who possess the certificate of mine environmental control legally recognized under the Mine Health and Safety Act, also with mine and ventilation registered as a voluntary technical organization? Check with that one. I do not know. That project more than. Uh, Barry, I think some of the questions can be directed later to Basitsa, and we can answer them because I've got another engagement at 12. I see we've got four, four minutes to go. No worries. And yeah, whoever has got like more questions, um, they can just always just direct them to us and then uh, yes. we will be oh, sharing some with you. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So if you okay. can just check on our slides, I just um, posted our email address there. So you can just share all your feedback and suggestions uh, in that. And then I think, yeah. um, you, Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, I Pleasure. think uh, the rest, yeah, they will be just sharing them on via email. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining Pleasure. and uh, have a great day, Feather. Thank you so much, Barry. And the, and the candidates, thanks for attending. I see it was full house 311. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye.